Hi everyone, I am Nketa Zibane and I'll be presenting PDA and the new NUITA. Just a recap of what happens during intrauterine life. The fetal circulation bypasses the pulmonary circulation. This is an image of what actually happens. The placenta is the main source of oxygenated blood during intrauterine life. And blood will flow from the placenta to the umbilical vein, to the ductus venosus, to the superior nuclear vena cover into the right atrium of which it will either directly flow into the left atrium by the foramen nasale and then into the aorta, or it will flow into the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery. In the pulmonary artery, this is where the ductus arteriosus plays a big role because it forms a communication between the pulmonary artery and the aorta, allowing for oxygenated blood to be delivered to the rest of fetal system circulation. During intrauterine life, the ductus arteriosus is actually maintained by the release of prostaglandins from the placenta. A PDA is an asymptomatic congenital heart disease in which there is a persistent communication between the descending thoracic aorta and the pulmonary artery due to failure of the normal physiological closure of the ductus arteriosus post fetal life. At birth, what happens is that the placenta, which is the major source of prostaglandin A2, is removed, and as the neonate takes their first breath in, oxygen concentration in the circulation increases, thereby closing the ductus arteriosus and allowing for normal neonatal circulation to occur. In a normal neonate, the functional closure of the ductus arteriosus takes about 15 hours after birth. Just a recap on the classification of congenital heart disease, in which it can either be classified as asynotic or cyanotic, and further subclassified as those with increased pulmonary blood flow and those with decreased pulmonary blood flow. So a PDA actually falls under asynotic with increased pulmonary blood flow. Of note is that PDA is the second commonest congenital heart disease in Uganda. In terms of etiology, prematurity is the commonest cause of PDAs, so a gestational age of less than 32 weeks due to the low oxygen content in the circulation because of the immature lungs and the respiratory system. This res then results in the failure of closure of the ductus arteriosus. And hence, this is why ductus arteriosus is recorded in a lot of um, infants with respiratory distress syndrome. Genetics as well is a common cause of which 5% of 10 neonates with PDAs have been reported to be linked to a recessive trait on chromosome 12 and a recurrence in siblings has been reported. Toxins and drugs as well. So some drugs that we actually prescribe such as phenytoin can cause a PDA and also the use of alcohol during pregnancy. The fourth cause is intrauterine infections such as rubella. Pathophysiology, a patent ductus arteriosus results in electroreaction. It allows blood to flow from the systemic circulation to the pulmonary circulation. This results in excessive pulmonary blood flow and hence the classification as an increased pulmonary blood flow in cyanotic heart disease. The larger the diameter of the PDA, the larger the electroreaction. The magnitude of the electroreaction is also determined by the pulmonary vascular resistance to the systemic vascular resistance. So if the SVR is greater than the PVR, the electroreaction will be larger. If there is no restriction of blood flow, pulmonary hypertension may also occur. In terms of the size of the PDA, a small PDA is less than 1.5 mm, while a moderate one is between 1.5 mm to 3 mm, and a severe PDA is greater than 3 mm. Symptoms. Symptoms are dependent on the size of the PDA. Small defects present with shortness of breath. Uh, the caregiver will also um, explain difficulty in feeding, wherein they get diaphoresis during feeding, and hence result in ineffective feeding. And for that reason, they present with failure to thrive. Moderate defects will present with recurrent lower respiratory tract infection, while severe ones will actually present in congestive cardiac failure. Clinical findings. Clinical findings also depend on the size of the PDA. Presentation varies from dyspnea to tachycardia to respiratory distress. 
In terms of cardiac exam, they may present with a collapsing pulse with an easily palpable dorsalis pedis, an active pericardium if they have a large left to right shunt and they may present with a murmur. The hallmark is usually a missionary murmur in midterm neonates just below the clavicle, while a systolic murmur is more common in preterm infants. A thrill may be audible as well. So approach to a child with a PDA. The first test that is done is a saturation test. This can be done in any nursery just before discharge. The advantage is that it's cheap and easy to conduct, therefore providing an easy way to determine if a neonate needs further cardiological intervention. This diagram is actually present in our NQ, and basically what it means is that um, just before discharge in a nursery, an infant should be screened. Their saturation should be taken in their right hand and in their right foot. If the saturation is less than 90 in either the right hand or the right foot, or if their saturation is less than 95 in either the right hand or the right foot, with a more than 3% difference in either the right hand or the right foot, then the test should be repeated after an hour. If the same still applies, you repeat the test again after an hour. If the same applies, then you know that this um, neonate has a positive test and needs further cardiological intervention. But if the test is done in a neonate and they have a saturation of greater than 95% um, in the right hand and the right foot, with a difference of less than 3% in the right hand and the right foot, and you repeat it after an hour, and then after an hour again, and the test is still the same, then that means it's a negative screen, and this particular neonate can go home. The second test that can be done is your arterial blood gas, which will then reveal normally very low PaO2s with high PaCO2s and also metabolic acidosis. A chest x-ray as well can be done. Chest x-ray may reveal cardiomegaly and pulmonary plethora. An echo can also be done to determine the size and anatomy of the PDA, the magnitude of the left to right shunt, and the ratio of the pulmonary to systemic circulation, left ventricular outflow, tract obstruction as well. An ECG, if done, will show signs consistent with left ventricular hypertrophy and also right ventricular enlargement. Cardiac catheterization can also be done if available in the institution. It's indicated for neonates with complicated PDA with the presence of pulmonary hypertension or in the case of a complex cardiac. It can be used as a therapeutic procedure for coil embolization or occluder or it can be used uh, to determine the shunt the amount of the shunt, the pulmonary pressure as well. An angiogram can also be done to determine the exact anatomy of the PDA, including the size of the vessels involved. In terms of management, in preterm infants, PDA is usually closed by the time uh, the infant reaches term. Spontaneous closure, however, is uncommon in term neonates. So, in terms of management, one, there's pharmacological closure that is effective within the first 14 days of life. So, in this case, drugs that inhibit prostaglandin synthesis are used. So, NSAIDs will be used, such as indomethacin. The added benefit for NSAIDs in uh, preterms is that it prevents intracranial hemorrhage as well. However, it has side effects such as cerebral vasoconstriction and nephrotoxicity. The second route of management will be cardiac catheterization closure, um, which has actually become very common, especially for isolated PDAs. So complications of cardiac catheterization closure of PDAs will be embolization of device being used to occlude the PDA, vessel injury, access site bleeding, stroke, and infection as well.
The third option of management is surgical ligation, which is actually the mainstay of treatment in neonates with large PDAs who also show signs of congestive cardiac failure. Then can, this can either be done through thoracoscopic surgical ligation or thoracotomy. Surgical closure indications are as follows. One, failure of pharmacological closure. Two, contraindications to pharmacological closure, such as thrombocytopenia or nephropathy. Signs of uh, CCF, not responsive to anti-failure medication. Failure of cardiac catheterization closure. A PDA found in an infant after the neonatal period should ideally be closed within the first year of life. Contraindications to closure. One would be severe pulmonary vascular disease if the closure of the PDA is not predicted to decrease pulmonary arterial pressure and, sorry, and also increase aortic pressures, then the closure of the PDA is contraindicated and should be planned carefully. Two will be the inability of the patient to withstand anesthesia such as sepsis. Surgical complications. Surgical complications are usually commonly attributed to the uh, thoracotomy itself. So injury to the aorta, to the pulmonary artery, and also injury to the laryngeal recurrent nerve, um, also post-operative site infection. Post-op management. So post-operatively, we need to optimize analgesia for this neonates, monitor for bleeding, monitor for sepsis as well. Um, usually, hospital stay post-procedure is minimal for isolated PDAs, maybe prolonged in preterm infants due to the presence of other organ abnormalities. Complications of an untreated PDA. So if untreated, they may present with left cardiac failure, pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular hypertrophy, aortic rupture, SN nervous syndrome, infective endocardial disease. Of note is ductal dependent lesions. Ductal dependent lesions require the administration of prostaglandin A1, which is prostin. As the presence of the duct in right heart obstructive lesions supply blood flow to the lungs, while in the left heart lesions, it supplies blood flow to the system. So an example of this duct-dependent lesions is your pulmonary atresia, tricuspid valve atresia, mitral valve atresia, aortic valve atresia, coarctation of the aorta, and transposition of red blood vessels. Just... Um, to zoom in on prostin a bit because we use it a lot for ductal dependent lesions and when a child is in the ward or in NICU being um, on prostin rather then it is very beneficial to know the side effects of prostin so that um, if a sister calls you for one of the side effects of prostin in a child who is currently getting prostin, then you know that this is probably a complication of prostin. So prostin is actually a prostaglandin A1 that relaxes arterial smooth muscle, resulting in vasodilation. So complications of prostin include your fever, seizures, diarrhea, apnea, hypertension, which may result in hypoxia. In turn, then resulting in metabolic acidosis because um, then the, the body results in anaerobic um, production of ATP and then in turn producing a lot of lactate and resulting in metabolic acidosis. Radicardia as well and cardiac arrest. And that is the end of the presentation. These are the references. Thank you.